Hi, I'm Fat Cat, health insurance company boss. Obamacare promised me lots of new customers. But wait a second. It says here I have to cover diet counseling, alcohol rehab, birth control, maternity care, and more. I'll have to raise my rates or I'll lose money. Unless I can get you taxpayers to bail me out. Uncle Sam? Shh, we don't call them bailouts. We don't want people to know what we're talking about, so we'll call it risk corridors. You know, whenever there's risk, Uncle Sam will race down a corridor with lots of your money and give it to companies that the politicians want to please. Here, have some tax money. See, isn't Obamacare great? It's not just Obamacare that controls us. The administration, in its eagerness to pass a law that would let government rule over health insurance, wanted to make sure it had insurance companies on its side. How could it do that? Because Obamacare forces insurance companies to cover much more stuff. Insurers knew Democrats wouldn't allow them to sharply raise their rates to pay for them. Tell insurance companies, if you lose money, don't worry. We'll bail out. Bailouts to big companies, especially insurance companies, are unpopular. So instead, the administration used an obscure insurance company term, risk corridors. That's why I embarrassed myself by dressing as Uncle Sam and doing those silly stunts. Risk corridors sounds meaningless. You can't get your brain around it unless you watch someone demonstrate it. But is it really this bad? Am I exaggerating? Let's ask the healthcare specialist Betsy McCoy. Is it really this bad? It is. It is corrupt. You're fooling the public using the public's own money. You're saying to these insurance companies, price your plans lower than what you actually need to cover your costs and we'll come around to the back door at the end of the year with John Q. Public's money to make to offset most of these losses. There it is in section 1342. And then worse than Betsy that... Betsy carries Obamacare with her wherever she right. goes. And this is why it's so telling. This bailout expires right after the 2016 election. They didn't want to make it permanent because permanent bailouts to companies would be really horrible, but it expires after he leaves office. That's right. So the plans are supposed to look affordable until he's out of office. But everybody knows the insurance companies couldn't possibly price them that way. They have to cover, as you pointed out, so many extra things. Alcohol rehab coverage, drug addiction coverage, diet care, obesity treatment, talk therapy, birth control, wellness visits. I mean, some people want Lots of nobody this. wanted to pay for. It's like passing well, a law. Well, some people wanted to pay for it. Sure, them. but most didn't, or they would have been in the plans to begin with. It's like passing a law that the only car you're allowed to buy is a fully loaded Cadillac. Obama sweetened the risk corridors after the law was passed. Let's not use the word sweeten because there's nothing sweetened about violating the Constitution. What he did was to enhance the, these risk corridors and offer the insurance companies even more than the law allows, circumventing Congress and offering it all by himself because he had said, you can keep your plan a year longer. And the insurance company said, that's going to cost us a bundle. And then the president said, don't worry, we'll make it up to you quietly with John Q. Public's money again. But let me tell you something, John. Well, and we make are entering the perfect storm for repeal, and this provision, Section 1342, ought to be the first thing repealed. He told the insurance companies, uh, the bill says the permissible profit margin is 3%, now it's 5%. Yeah, that's a big increase. And, and plus, insurance companies can, uh, can incur expenses other than your health care, such as salaries and profit margins that they didn't have before. So it really did sweeten it for them, but it violated the Constitution because the president is not allowed to change the law by himself. So it's bad enough it was in there. He right. illegally raises it. And there's just about no reporting on this because it's boring. Bailouts you can get your brain around, but risk corridors. Well, and they were very deceptive. They took an insurance company term, risk corridors, and pretended it was the same thing. But it's not. Thank you, Betsy. Uh, of course, Obamacare happened in the first place because Democrats and some Republicans, let's not forget Romney Care, think consumers can't be trusted to arrange for their own health care. Some people don't buy health insurance, or if they do, the plans they choose, they aren't good enough. Some people wait till they get sick. And then they rush to high-cost emergency rooms. And whatever we think, whatever we critics of Obamacare say, it is true. More people now have health insurance.
The final score speaks for itself. There are seven and a half million people across the country that have the security of health insurance, most of them for the very first time. That's fewer than they had predicted. Now they're saying nine and a half million will have signed up by this winter, but they originally thought it would be 13 million. Still, seven million new people have health insurance. Dr. Kathleen London of Doctors for America is thrilled about that. But Ovik Roy of the Manhattan Institute says she and the president missed the point. What do you mean? The number of people who've signed up on the exchange isn't the number of people with new insurance. There are five million people who lost their insurance because their plans are now illegal. So if you add up the people who got insurance on the exchange, the people who got insurance through Medicaid, and the people who lost their insurance through various means, it's probably more so like five million. So why are you million. so happy? It's still allowing people to get coverage who had no other means of getting coverage. When you look at people who have been married to their job, having employer-based insurance keeps people stuck. Just last week, one of my colleagues saw in the emergency room and brought their child You're a in. practicing physician. I'm a practicing physician. I'm a family medicine physician. One of my colleagues saw this little girl in the ER who came in pale, unknown fever, um, and high white count, and after all the tests were done, had the unfortunate news to break that their child had leukemia. What they didn't know was dad had quit his job a month ago to start his own business. And guess what? Doesn't have insurance. So now, instead of the first question being, is my child going to be okay? His question is, how am I going to pay for cancer treatments? Yeah, Ovik, what do you say to people I mean, like yeah. that? It's not everybody can pay for expensive health care. It's a great point. So free market advocates for a long time have advocated just that kind of a system where instead of getting insurance through your employer, you own that tax break yourself and you can shop for whatever plan you want and you can take it wherever you want. The problem with Obamacare is that actually the, the story you just described is the exception. The much more common scenario is that the law actually discourages people from staying in the workforce because in order to maintain those benefits, their income has to be so low that it, they can't actually seek real work. I was there in 2007. I was living in Massachusetts and had my own practice there when Romney stood up with the Heritage Foundation, very similar to the think tank you work at, when the individual mandate was yeah, that lauded was, as a wonderful right. thing. This came yeah, so, from a Republican so, so, think tank. This so why idea. is it now bad in no. 2014? Please explain that to no. me. The average price of an individually purchased health insurance plan is 49% higher today than it was last year because Obamacare mandates and regulates how insurance plans can be designed. Is it Apple's to apples because that's not what you're seeing out of Kaiser oh. because a lot of those plans that were around before were the ones that oh went away when you really needed them yeah. so that's, that's buyer beware true. kind of insurance that's and, that's not thing. True. and if you really want to be fiscally conservative yeah. you go to single payer yeah, no. and are we ready okay. to swallow that as a country so single payer the government just pays for everybody well, no, 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 it's no, no, all no. of us whatever we want no it, it's not it's saying that so it's saying that we're going to set uh, the the things that are absolutely necessary preventive care urgent care it, things like that, and then they, we would have insurance for the rest of it. It is what every other industrialized nation does, and does it very well. They freeload off us. They don't innovate. That's not true. Right, I'll give point. you another example of another patient, another real-world story. A woman being wheeled in, having a heart attack, being wheeled into the cath lab, which is what we do when somebody has a heart attack. We take them right into the cath lab. Who yells, stop, wait, me, let me see if my insurance covers this. Her f husband had died four years before. She has a 16-year-old, doesn't want to leave her children with giant medical bills. What about but the 29-year-old? No, no, no hospital refuses here's, to treat the here's, truly here's the issue. Here's the issue. No, exactly. Issue. The, well, they'll they're they're having a heart attack, bills. they're going to treat you. The number one cause of bankruptcy in America is still no, medical. That's, that's not true. So, but here's the thing. You want to have catastrophic insurance to protect Catast people against the financial loss. But let, 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 let me talk for a second, okay? You've had a lot of time to talk. So for routine health care expenditures, you don't need insurance to pay for that. It's like if you had car insurance that paid for gasoline and wiper fluid and tire changes, then your car wash would cost a lot more money. That. So no, look, so if you look at the countries in the world where they have a system where they don't insure for those routine expenses, health care costs a lot less than it does in America. It's like the difference between an open bar and a cash bar. If you go to a cash bar, you get the Bud Light or the house wine. If you have an open bar, if it's the in-law's wedding, you're going to get the single malt scotch. But and that's people don't have care. When we had that before, people don't do their preventative care. Okay. That's the issue. And they wait till it's very expensive to come treat it. That's, Whereas that's not if you come in true. right before your diabetes is out of control and you need an amputation, it's a whole lot easier but for it to be treated. there's no evidence that preventative care is saving America oh, any money. Absolutely. Most recent, the states yeah. that expanded Medicaid, we now have a much lower preemie birth rate.
That's that, right there. That's but, a, that's, that's, and that's, that's 60,000 people are also in getting industry. all this false treatment for stuff that would have never become a problem because the doctors say, oh, this might happen. They overtreat. We could have a rational insurance system in this country that protects people against catastrophic financial loss, but allows them to pay for routine health expenditures, driving those costs down. That's not what we do, and that's not what Obamacare does. Obamacare, Obamacare forces, forbids it. You Obamacare can't have too big it. a deductible. That's exactly right. So Obamacare actually doubles down on all the things that are bad about the system now and just spends more money. Money on it. And I see why you like it, because you have patients who are getting paid and they're coming in and getting everything. But how can America afford this? We, it was the first step and it was the best plan we could get through that Congress. Thank you, Ovik. Kathleen, to join this argument, please follow me on Twitter at FBN Stossel. Use the hashtag No They Can't. We pick that because Washington's control freaks say they can make our lives better if they control more of it. But I say, no, they can't. I said it in that great book. We individuals make our lives better, but for the most part, Washington can't. Anyway, please tweet us or like my Facebook page uh, so you can post on my wall. We want to know what you think. Coming up, how Washington's control freaks use this little animal to torture property owners. But next, some of the businesses that freak out the control freaks. At this shooting range in Maryland, everyone's shooting bullets made by an ammunition company called Tomcat, including the last shooter you saw, Kat O'Connor. She owns the company, and she's here with Brian Wise, who runs a group called U.S. Consumers Coalition. Both are upset by a secretive project from control freaks in Washington called Operation Choke Point. So, Brian, what's that? a program that the Department of Justice is pursuing uh, that essentially intimidates banks and payment processors to stop doing business with industries that they fundamentally don't like. And people like CAT are being affected and losing the ability to provide their services mm. and their products to Bad consumers. industries like CAT makes ammunition. That's right. Companies that say, as seen on TV, I, I have this list that got leaked from the Department of Justice. They didn't want to reveal this. Firearms makers, payday loans sellers, pornography, surveillance equipment, tobacco sales, lots of companies. They didn't want this program to be released, as you mentioned, uh, to the public at all. Uh, but most of these industries are industries that they've tried to legislate out of existence over the past 20 or 30 years. They haven't been able to do that, and, and so the Obama administration, under the direction of Eric Holder at the Department of Justice, has decided we're going to come up with a creative way to go after these industries. We're going to find the one unifying factor uh, that brings together all of these industries, and what is that? everyone needs a bank. Everyone needs a payment processor. And so we're going to go to the banks. We're going to intimidate them into stopping uh, their client relationships with all of these, uh, these companies. So Kat, how did you find out you'd been choked by Operation Choke Point? We were told twice um, by payment processors that we were rejected due to our industry. That was pretty much the only explanation that we were given. You, you suddenly find you couldn't use your PayPal account. We could not use PayPal Business Pro, which is the credit card processing that links to your website. They would not allow us to, uh, they would not approve our application. So you then tried to open a bank account and the bank said? I was told by the branch manager, you can have your bank account, but you can't have gateway services due to your industry. And that means credit card processing? Exactly. So you still don't have that? I don't have it right now. Thousands of companies uh, throughout the country are uh, right now receiving letters from their banks saying that they can no longer have bank accounts and that they can no longer use credit card processing services. And that's only the ones that we know about. Uh, yeah, here's a tweet from a, a porn star. Tegan Presley tweets, Thank you, Chase, for closing my personal account that I've had since I was 18. The Department of Justice uh, started with uh, industries like payday lending and pornography companies. Uh, and they have now moved into check cashing, debt collection services, and all the way to guns and ammunition sales and tobacco sales. The letter they received from the bank doesn't ever say Operation Choke Point on it. It's just after 25 years of doing business one, with one of these banks, they receive a letter saying, We can no longer bank you and you need to move your money someplace else. 
Now, the collectivists in the media who support big governments, control freaks, love things like Operation Choke Point. Here's a New York Times editorial. Choke Point hits the mark. Uh, fortunately, some people in Congress were upset enough to summon a few of the Justice Department's people to a hearing. Who has determined fraud? You're an attorney at the DOJ. Has there been a, has there been due process? Has there been a hearing? Has there been an adjudication of fraud? No. Your lawyers recognized that legitimate businesses were in fact being harmed, but decided that the ends justified the means. Yeah, it's great to see members of Congress doing their duty, pushing back against the control freaks. So, were the abusive lawyers from the DOJ cringing with guilt? No. Here's the bureaucrats' opening statement. Our policy is to investigate specific unlawful conduct based on evidence that consumers are being defrauded. And so on and on he went. Uh, we asked the Department of Justice to come on this show and explain you know, that what they're doing is okay, but they did not respond. So, do they respond to your complaints? Well, uh, ironically, the only response that we've gotten from the Department of Justice is when we start going out and talking about this publicly. Kat, some people would say it's not a threat. You, you're making ammunition. Ammunition isn't good. And you, you really should be policed. The bullets kill people. Yeah, I do have a federal firearms license, and I have two licenses from the state of Maryland to uh, deal and manufacture an explosive. So it, it's highly regulated already. They don't ever pair them back, right? They always want more. More. All this more. Thank you, Kath, Brian. Coming up, the control freaks plan to ban tobacco sales. I find smoking to be one of the most disgusting habits anybody could possibly do. And I love to bet on sports. And why not? It's my money. Isn't it my choice? No, say the control freaks. That's next. Governor Chris Christie signed a bill that partially legalizes sports betting in the Garden State. Okay, it's about time. Millions of us bet on sports. Finally, some politicians will make it legal. Except they only want to legalize betting in casinos and other state-controlled facilities. And even that was too much for the control freaks. They threatened lawsuits. If someone wants to stop us, then they'll have to take action to try to stop us. And they did. The big sports leagues, the pros, sued to block legal sports betting in Jersey, and a judge did stop it, at least for now. People I interviewed in Times Square agreed government should prevent us from gambling. Should betting on sports be allowed? Never. But you should not be able to bet. It encourages people, poor people, to spend money they don't have. It does, sometimes. But aren't free Americans allowed to do what we want with our own money? No, says Rob Walgate of the conservative think tank American Policy Roundtable. Why not? Well, people are free to gamble on sports. It's legal in this country in spots right now, John. If you bet with a friend, or if you have a friendly poker game, no house taking the cut, it's legal in some parts of the country, not all. In some parts of the country, but what Chris Christie and others have tried to do is clearly illegal, and they've tried to get around it by passing laws and forcing court actions. Well, it may be illegal, but only because foolish control freaks on your side have made it illegal. Why should it be illegal? Why can't I do whatever I want with my money? Are you advocating for the ability to bet on any sport wherever you want, anytime you want, yes. from your mobile device, yes. anywhere? If we put this anywhere and everywhere, and we have our mobile devices and we're able to do that, it's going to open up a can of worms, especially when you talk about, I'm not here to defend the four pro sports leagues or the NCAA, but I think when you look at NCAA athletes and what they've sold recently when it comes to their own personal merchandise and they've gotten in trouble for $5,000 or even a few hundred is a lot of money. And you may see college sports go away as you know it. When we expand it and it gets everywhere, there is going to be, and I know you're labeling it control freaks, but I think when we read yeah, the sorry about that, yeah. but uh, I've been called worse. But when we read the Federalist Papers, we see what James Madison said: "If men were angels, we'd need no laws." So we have the laws, but it doesn't stop athletes from occasionally fixing games. We we have this uh, James Winston, the, the freshman Heisman Trophy winner, remarkable athlete, allegedly shaved points. Uh, in one game. Well, uh, well there's, allegedly, and there's some 
there's some stuff being talked about. An that. NBA but, ref uh, is in jail for making calls that affected point spreads. So, but it's already illegal. It happens. In England, it's legal. It doesn't happen. Oh, it's happened there with tennis scandals and the fact that people could gamble, as well as golfers are able to wager on themselves in England. And that's an individual sport, so it's a bit different. But to think of Jameis Winston or think of Tim Donahue, that happened in an illegal environment. If we open this up and it becomes illegal on every street corner, the thought that it's not going to expand and happen more and taxpayers are going to be left holding the bill, to subsidize another group of people who can't second, afford I, it. I don't know about tennis games in, in Britain, but we researched it, and all we could find in the BBC says in 1964, eight players were jailed for fixing a soccer game. The previous incident we could find was from 1915. When we study gambling and the expansion of gambling around the country or around the world, it is on the decline everywhere. So the thought, and I know Chris gambling Kirk, is on the decline. Absolutely, fewer the, people gamble. The government gets less money. The problem is they're sucking that money out of the economic engine of certain states, and they're wasting the money they do pull away. The more people, the more money people gamble, the less they can spend on cars, washers and dryers, and homes. Why isn't it my choice? It is your choice. Gambling is a legal activity. You can gamble right now. I, I can't bet on the NFL this year. There's no, or unless I can find someone to take the other side, I'm not well, allowed to go to someone. Gambling on the NFL is legal in the state of Nevada. If you want to gamble in the NFL, you can do it tomorrow. But I have to fly to Nevada. And that keeps the people that are able to afford to go gambling on the NFL. Thank you, Rob Walgate. Coming up. It's Nanny Steak on Wild. They want to police what you do for pleasure, how you eat, and why they like this little animal a lot more than they like you. The nanny state is alive and well. It sure is, and the control freaks always want more. They want to protect us from ourselves by limiting what we eat, what we do for pleasure, even how we give to charity. They think it's their duty. And I admit I was guilty of this kind of thinking. As a young consumer reporter, I did all this research on what doctors said was bad for us, and I wanted to help stamp it out. After all, lives were at stake. And People have lives. They don't have time to check everything out and find out what's harmful. It's important that the state protect us. The concept of individual freedom was not on my radar screen. Uh, I apologize. I was ignorant and arrogant. But at least I had no real power. I couldn't force consumers to avoid unhealthy things. I couldn't force any business to stop selling something. Only government can do that. And sadly, government's filled with people just as ignorant and arrogant as I was, but they do get to use force. Economist Matthew Mitchell covers regulation for the Mercatus Center, and he wised up to the damage control freaks much more quickly than I did. But, you know, these regulations do save lives. The truth is a lot of these regulations have a lot of unintended consequences. So take, uh, you know, seatbelts. This is often argued. Surely seatbelts save this lives. This is the best one that's always thrown up against libertarians. Sure. Look, you know, thousands of lives saved. Sure. So uh, if you think about the cost that you bear for driving recklessly, right, if you lower the cost of driving recklessly by, for example, making it less likely that you'll be injured when you drive recklessly, people will demand greater speed, right? So it turns out there's a famous study from 1975, an economist named Sam Peltzman looked at the data and he found, sure enough, after the introduction of seatbelt laws, people actually drove rec uh, more recklessly, accidents increased. Now, the probability of getting injured during an accident did fall, but the two effects roughly canceled out, but there's one, one, one factor that, that uh, wasn't canceled out, and that is that pedestrian deaths and cyclist deaths, who of course are not uh, protected by seatbelts, those rose. Consumers make trade-offs in other ways. If you mandate that all new cars have to have all kinds of expensive features, for example, backup cameras, now this discourages people from buying new cars. So now you drive around on clunkers that are more dangerous for other reasons. Let's talk about secondhand smoke. Um, I'm amazed by how willingly people just give up for you. That it started by saying some bars would could ban smoking. But mm -hmm. now in 24 states, smoking in bars 
is illegal in every bar. Right. Can't the smokers have some bars? All right. Well, so this is another one where there's unintended consequences. Those areas where they introduced bans on smoking, uh, actually you saw an increase in accidents related to uh, alcohol. The theory is that um, people are driving longer distances in order to find bars that either have outside seating <laughs> or are outside of the jurisdiction. And were you surprised that smokers didn't resist? People yeah. just give it, give up. I mean, I don't smoke. Mm -hmm. I don't mind it, but a third of the country did at the time. Yeah, it is interesting how quickly people are willing to give up their freedoms. But that's not what America is supposed to be about. And now some control freaks in Massachusetts want tobacco sales banned altogether. Officials in Westminster want to make it illegal to sell all tobacco products to anyone, including adults. Last week, the town held a hearing about that. 500 people showed up. I like what this guy said. I find smoking to be one of the most disgusting habits anybody could possibly do. On top of that, I find this proposal to be even more of a disgusting thing that anybody could ever give any town in the United States of America. Yes, eventually, the town officials there even shut down that meeting. But maybe people are wising up now and saying enough. Well, you know, we often think, are accustomed to thinking about the federal government and federal overreach. But the truth is that a lot of the most intrusive regulations happen at the local level, just like this. The regulators at least can make a pretty good argument that smoking hurts people and seat belts save lives. But the regulators always want more things like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Beginning March 12th, sugary beverages will no longer be sold by food establishments in portions greater than 16 ounces. That was my control freak mayor a couple of years ago. A court threw out his soft drink ban, but the proposals keep coming. Recently, Berkeley, California passed a tax on sweetened drinks. Mm -hmm. uh, a tax, at least, is less onerous than a ban. Anything that the government wants to accomplish with a regulation, it can also accomplish with a tax. We know from a previous earlier Supreme Court, John Marshall, you know, says the power to tax is the power to destroy. So it, be, it, there's some point beyond which uh, taxation really can, can accomplish whatever government wants. As I said earlier, members of the media often act like the control freaks cheerleaders, and I was one once. MSNBC, of course, is still one. But now maybe the nanny state's gone so far that even the most ridiculous people get upset. Is feeding the homeless a crime? A new law in one Florida town says it is. Two pastors and a 90-year-old volunteer are facing jail time after they were arrested for feeding the homeless. What? Really? Well, yes, Fort Lauderdale passed rules on public food sharing. How and where you can give people food. And boy, when Al Sharpton gets upset about the nanny state, they really have gone overboard. We emailed the mayor. He told us the 90-year-old man was not arrested. Uh, what's your take? This is a guy. He's been feeding the homeless in a park for over 35 years. He's a chef. He yeah. dresses. He's a chef. He's been doing it. Um, the, the mayor's take is that he, he, he's not trying to outlaw this. He's just trying to make it safe. Simple economics tells you, however, if you raise the cost of giving food away, people are going to give less food away, and homeless people are going to find that their, their next meal is harder to come by. But this one, I think, is my weakest case, and of course, that's the one Al Sharpton embraces, because there is something called a public square. And in, in Florida, merchants were saying, we've got all these vagrants, they're urinating in front of my store, the diners can't eat outdoors. The, the town gets to police the public square. Mm -hmm. So I think you can make a much stronger case for regulation in a public square than you can in a private bar and a private uh, uh, owned um, piece of property. Uh, in this case, you know, it, it may be possible for them to find another place for them to feed the homeless. Thank you, Matthew Mitchell of the wonderful Mercatus Center. Next, the control freaks, as always, want more. We have another hole over to the side. They say, if these guys visit your backyard, you don't really own your property anymore. Isn't that a cute little animal? It's a Utah prairie dog. Environmentalists and other governments say it's endangered and therefore you must not harm one. 
They go further. You must not harm it or pursue it, hunt it, shoot it, wound it, kill, trap, capture, collect, or harass it. Harass it? Well, yes, two men harassed manatees by doing this. You ready? Get him, get him, get him. <laughs> he jumped in the water next to one and posted this video of that. The two guys were sent to jail for this. You don't mess with the control freaks at the Fish and Wildlife Service. Except this man did. He messed with them by fighting them in court. He was upset because he's owned land that he hasn't been able to develop because it's infested with prairie dogs. Last year he came on this show to complain about the government. And this month Bruce is back because... You won. Congratulations. A court ruled the Constitution doesn't give the feds the right to forbid him from driving prairie dogs off his land. His lawyer is Jonathan Wood of the Pacific Legal Foundation. So tell us about this court decision. It is the first time a federal court has enforced the Constitution's limits on the Endangered Species Act. The court held that the Congress's power to regulate commerce doesn't extend to regulating a species that's only located in one small part of Utah. So that sounds like a technical commerce clause lawyer decision, but what, what calls me is that this prairie dog isn't even all that rare. There are 40,000 of them around? Of the Utah, Utah prairie dog. Correct. And there are even more black-tailed prairie dogs? Correct. The only difference between the Utah prairie dog and the millions of other prairie dogs in this country is the color of its tail. Well, it's not the only difference. The Utah prairie dog only grooms itself, while the black-tailed dogs groom each other. So there are some other differences. Now, but I didn't know that. <laughs> the environmentalists say, look, that makes it a unique species, and if that means you can't develop your land, so be it. We're not being governed by laws from Congress or the judiciary from the courts. We're being judged by laws written administrative laws written by bureaucrats and so a bureaucrat can tell me what I can and cannot do with my own property and then they hold a big hammer over my head to make sure that I do it. The fine for prairie dogs if I were to harm or harass even one is ten thousand dollars and five years in federal prison. For one, and you have about 85 on your property. Correct. There, there's there's a process to remove them. There's a waiting list. There was a waiting list that took about three years to get to the first of the list, and then I could remove 10 of my 85 prairie dogs, and then I went down to the bottom of the list again and had to wait. So in reality, it was an impossibility to ever rid myself of prairie dogs. Now, it's kind of hard to get your brain around why he so needs to get rid of them and what prairie dogs can do to people like Bruce, but Fox's Los Angeles reporter did a good job showing how prairie dog holes make it dangerous for kids to play, and they do other nasty things to a neighborhood. We have another hole. And here in Iron County, Utah, they've had enough. Folks here say the critter isn't threatened, it's taking over. From real estate and development to a local church where the pastor says it's too dangerous for kids to play. God's given us dominion over the animals. Right now, the animals, ha animals have dominion over us. Connie Robinson is mayor of Paragona, Utah. Her town cemetery is falling apart. We've had a problem for 20 years. At first they were pests and then they started undermining the stones and they were tipping over. Most people are getting sick and tired of putting up with them because they have more rights and, and better paid lawyers than what we do. <laughs> better paid lawyers. Well, you're working for free on, on this case here. Animals are helpless. Property owners are rich people. Uh, I don't. I don't think that's true. So the there are a lot of very powerful, very wealthy environmental groups on the other side that are paying attention to this issue and are lobbying for species to be added to the list by the hundreds. A group called Friends of Animals, they're <laughs> is saying that we're going to appeal. The Tenth Circuit will make short work of this embarrassing judicial work. Uh, the government partners with these environmental groups. Yeah, that's right. The Friends of Animals came in on the side of the government to help them defend the lawsuit. And uh, thankfully, they weren't enough. The, the, as I said, the, the court ruled that the Commerce Clause limits still apply and that people like Bruce should be able to use their property. Don't you want to protect God's creatures? 
We have plenty, and yes, we do want to protect them. On the day that the ruling uh, came down, and they said, now, are you going to run out and kill all the prairie dogs on your property? And I said, no, we're not interested in killing prairie dogs. We're simply interested in our constitutional rights of private property, which we currently don't have. Control freaks. Thank you, Bruce, Jonathan. Coming up, my take on what it means for freedom when congressmen say things like this. It takes a long time to put the legislation together to control the people. Do you notice I opened this show with a clip of a congressman saying this? It takes a long time to put the legislation together to control the people. Politicians work hard to control the people. That was no ordinary congressman. That's John Dingell. He's been in office 59 years. Yes, 59. Here he is with President Truman. Dingell's father was a congressman, too. He was first elected in 1933. He died in office and was replaced by his son. Dingell Jr. will finally retire this year. Next year, his district will be represented by a younger person, a woman, Debbie Dingell. Wait, Dingell? Same name? Oh, yes, his wife. Debbie worked for GM. The family made millions from GM, while Congressman Dingell pushed for five bailouts for GM. <sighs> Aside from protecting his hometown automaker, Dingell's been as much of a control freak as anyone in Congress. The Endangered Species Act we just talked about? Dingell's website says he wrote the ESA. I wonder what Debbie will control. She's almost 30 years younger than John, so maybe she'll stay in office 59 years too. That'll give her plenty of time to ban lots of things. Do they ever unban anything? Well, occasionally. From this day on, the 18th Amendment is doomed. They did legalize alcohol after they banned it, and now a few states have legalized weed, but generally the control freaks only increase control. Take cigarettes. At first it was just warning labels. Then bans on TV ads. Then they required restaurants to have no smoking sections. Then came the bans on airplanes, schools, workplaces, entire restaurants, then bars too. And now sometimes apartments and outdoor spaces even. I mean, frankly, I like the bans. I don't smoke. I've come to hate the smell of secondhand smoke. But can't smokers have some bars? No one has to come in here. Can't a smoker who after work looks forward to an evening like this with a cigarette in his hand have this moment? No. In about half of America, this is now illegal, and state by state, the smokers just take it. And by the way, the secondhand smoke scare turns out to be bunk. But the smokers still take it. When the nanny state gives its commands, most everyone quietly just gives up his freedom. That's why I was encouraged by last week's town meeting, where after that town wanted to ban all tobacco sales, hundreds of people showed up and complained. I find smoking to be one of the most disgusting habits anybody could possibly do. On top of that, I find this proposal to be even more of a disgusting thing that anybody could ever give any town in the United States of America. Maybe that pushback will stop that ban in that town, but the control freaks always want more. There are about 50 cities with their own plastic bag ban. A ban on large capacity ammunition magazines. Boycott the sale of alcohol. You should be banned from coming to the United States. We should use every reasonable precaution. It's always more. On this show I talk a lot about economic freedom. The world now knows economic freedom is what creates prosperity. Prosperity is a big deal, but the free part, which sounds a little vague, is just as important. Individual choices matter. I object to restrictions on choice not because I like choice or not just because I like choice. It's a moral objection. When government limits our control over our own lives, we become less. Something changes in our character. We become smaller. People on the left and right believe government should promote good things. 
discourage bad ones. If you're on the right, maybe you think government should promote marriage or religious charities. Maybe you think it should ban porn, pot, and violent video games. But if it's government's job to promote what's good and suppress the bad, that's a license for the control freaks to stick their noses into everything we do. Politicians and voters can dream of controls in our constantly changing world. No more destructive gambling. Every prairie dog is preserved. High interest loans vanish. Your health care is paid for efficiently by strangers in Washington. Politicians can dream about that, but they can't do it. No, they can't and they shouldn't try. As Frederick Hayek said, the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. They can't. That's our show. See you next week.